This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. This is a Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church. Today is Sunday, the 30th of May. Uh, I guess Memorial Day is coming up. And if you're in Virginia Beach, we've had some much needed rain over the weekend. And uh, hopefully and prayerfully, maybe the Memorial Day itself will be a dry day and everyone can, can enjoy the day. But I want to thank everyone for uh, for dialing in, listening in rather. And uh, I just want to go ahead and and get, uh, get going with our uh, Bible study for this morning. Um, this week, uh, we will be looking at the third chapter of Jonah. And also this week is our last week that we will be in the Old Testament for a while. Next week, we will be in the New Testament and we will be studying the Gospel of Matthew for about three to four weeks. So with that being said, let's go ahead and I'm gonna enlarge my screen just for a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and let's get uh, started with our Sunday morning Bible study. Let us pray. Eternal God in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful Sunday that you have blessed us to see. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of Jesus now, Lord, to quiet our hearts and prepare our minds to receive your holy word. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would now allow the Holy Spirit to take control of this ministry. Lord, to Lord, just keep us mindful of who we are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we just ask and pray that your words might be a light unto our, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Our verse, key verse for this morning's lesson is coming from Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. Now, before I uh, begin, brothers and sisters, there's something about Jonah that we all on the surface understand. We can read it and we understand about the fish. We understand about Jonah, you know, just running from God. But Jonah, this 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 morning's uh, study is going to take us in a direction that I think um, few of us have gone. And so I I want you to uh, pay close attention to uh, the words that the Holy Spirit has given me to to say in this matter because uh, not only was it a um, a learning experience for me, <clears throat> but I pray that it may also be a learning experience for you also. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and read our key verse for this morning. Again, Jonah chapter three, verse 10, it reads, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And so, our lesson background, it says that the book of Jonah only has four chapters, but they teach us a lot about the character of God and the character of Jonah as well. Now, Jonah was not the first prophet who was reluctant to answer the call of God. We all know this. We know that uh, from, from reading Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, that it reads, and there, there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And yet, brothers and sisters, he resisted God's call to go to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, we find also in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, how he tried to find reasons not to go back to Egypt not to answer the call, but he finally acquiesced. In other words, brothers and sisters, he finally said, yes, yes, Lord. And in Exodus chapter four, verse 18, Moses goes to Jethro, his father-in-law, and as the respect of the cultures go, he asked Jethro to let him go so that he may return to Egypt, though he had fled from Egypt um, 40 years ago. And so, 
Jeremiah, he thought that he was too young to be a prophet, to answer God's call. Isaiah, Isaiah had a, had a language problem. He had a, a foul language problem. He thought that he wasn't he wasn't worthy to be called uh, to um, carry God's message to the people. But in all these examples, in all these examples, these men eventually obeyed the Lord. God knew the potential of these and other prophets of the Old Testament. And when God chooses a person, the Lord knows already that this is the right person for the mission at hand. And so a perfect example of this was uh, the, the brothers, uh, were the brothers Moses and Aaron. Now, though being the older, God chooses the younger of the two. Now you'll find later on in scripture, especially when it comes to uh, Rebecca and um, Isaac, and uh, not Isaac, but uh, Jacob and Esau, that the Lord will also say to Rebecca that the older shall serve the younger. Now we see the character of Moses. Moses was strong, he was committed. As opposed to Aaron, who yielded to the wishes of the crowd and in weakness, he sinned, he sinned against God by making a golden calf that the people ended up worshiping. And it caused a great, great sin. He caused a great, great sin to happen upon uh, the children of Israel. But Jonah, however, Jonah's a little bit different. Uh, when called by God to go to Nineveh, Jonah not only refused to go, but his stubbornness, unlike earlier prophets and defiance, it went beyond his predecessors. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, Moses and the children of Israel was opposed by Pharaoh's army. That is true. Isaiah had the Assyrian army to contend with. That is true, brothers and sisters. And Jeremiah had the Babylonian army to contend with. But Jonah's hatred for the Assyrians and his hatred for Gentiles in general exceeded his obedience to God. And, and for that, Jonah is going to have a real problem here in a little while as we, as we continue on. Not only was he willing to run from God and go in a self-imposed exile rather than obey God, but his stubbornness almost cost the lives of innocent men. And so perhaps, Perhaps Jonah may have been mirroring Israel, if you will, which was a nation that believed that, that by God choosing them meant that he cared more about them or that he cared about them exclusively more than he cared about any other or the other nations. But we find in Genesis chapter 26, verse four, brothers and sisters, that it is quite clear. God said to Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel, he says this, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven, he says, and I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, peoples of other nations who have the, who will have uh, the faith of Abraham, who will believe and obey God, will also be called the children of Abraham. And so <clears throat> our lesson um, for today, as we begin in Genesis, uh, Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, now the Lord the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Now, let's back up for a moment, brothers and sisters, because here's what happens. In 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, it introduces us to the prophet Jonah, who was the son of Amittai. Now, Isaiah may have been the, the prophet during the days of Hezekiah, 
and may have had knowledge of the same atrocities Jonah might have experienced regarding the Assyrians. But the difference is that while Isaiah went forward, Jonah went backwards, you see. In other words, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and other prophets, other prophets, they mainly prophesied concerning Israel and Judah and against nations that came against her. But Jonah, Jonah was chosen for a different mission and to a different type of people, if you will, but for the same purpose. In other words, he was sent to preach to the very people whose king showed no mercy to his captives, whose army some people would rather commit suicide than to be captured. But God's mercy and grace extends beyond the boundaries of Israel, brothers and sisters, that it might reach other nations and indeed other worlds, if you think about it. Because all, God has created all things. Uh, just because God has a, a focus in the scripture on, on the earth doesn't mean that nothing else exists except us. But we'd be foolish to think that. And so it says that the key to understanding any Bible book, gospel, or acts, if you will, is to find the setting in which it was first written to whom it was written first, to whom it was first addressed, and especially, especially what message is conveyed to them. So we know that it was written to Jews of all generations. We know that because it's in the scriptures. It's a part of the, it is a part of the, the Old Testament scriptures. But it also conveyed a message to unrepentant Jews in the days of Jesus in the New Testament. And so, its application extends to the Gentiles' rejection of God's grace and mercy that was uh, found in Christ Jesus also. And so we can be sure, brothers and sisters, that the story of Jonah is biblically accurate because even Jesus mentions it in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41. And we find it also in Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 31. And in 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. So I, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to read these verses of scripture sometime. And so that takes us to our lesson background, uh, lesson outline rather, for today. And as I've read in verses one and two, it says that uh, again, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and preach to it the message that I tell you. And so what we have to uh, understand first of all is, well, what happened the first time around? We know from chapter one that the word of the Lord first came to Jonah who was the son of Amittai, according to 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. We know this. It was his father, Amittai, who prophesied mercy upon Israel, Jonah's father. So Jonah is, Jonah is, is mentioned in 2 Kings before we get to the book of Jonah. And during the reign of Jeroboam, Jer Jeroboam II, it says that Israel prospered greatly. But God had a mission for Amittai's son. God had a mission for, for Jonah. And in order to, 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 to complete that mission, he had to leave his country and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message God says that I tell you. In other words, God has given, just like the old law, uh, the other prophets, God has given Jonah a message tell a people that he truly, truly hated. God had told him to arise, go to Jonah, but don't expect, brothers and sisters, Jonah to bow before the ground, a ground, ground bow to the, uh, the ground in obedience to God. In his defense, 
Not many, if any, prophets readily obeyed God when they were first called by God. But Jonah, Jonah was a little different. Jonah not only had a streak of resistance towards God's call, but he was in defiance to God's command. Whereas we don't see this with the other prophets. And herein lies Jonah as an example of defiant Israel in fulfilling his divine mission and her unwillingness to, quote, see God's mercy extend beyond Israel's border. Israel was supposed to be the shining light, the nation, that righteous nation that other nations were to look to for righteous guidance and righteousness. Israel was to be that light. Uh, Jonah, like other prophets, you know, he could have, he could have prophesied against Nineveh from the safety of his own land. He could have done that. Um, but God wanted the people of Nineveh to hear firsthand the words of a Hebrew prophet from the land of Israel spoken to a nation who has already taken captive countless others and was Israel's greatest enemy during this time in history. And so, again, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to compare or to juxtapose the character of God against the character of Jonah. God is God. And see, he sees the bigger picture, whereas Jonah only sees the here and now, as all humans do, for the most part. In, a, in chapters 1 and 2, we are given a, few, the, a view of a defiant man. He was set out to do what? He was trying to outsmart God and found himself about to be thrown in the depths of the sea because of his stubbornness and because of his defiance. He first tries to outrun God by heading in the opposite direction towards Joppa instead of going to Nineveh. That was his first mistake. Nowhere do we read in the scripture where God tries to convince Jonah to turn around, though. Okay, and he's just moving along. He just thinks he's he's not, he refuses. He refuses to obey God's word, God's command. That's how much he hated the Gentiles and in particular, the Assyrians. And so uh, Jonah has to learn who's really in control in this situation. He has to learn this. So when God troubles the sea on which he was traveling and the threat of the men's lives now being in danger because of him, something different happens. And this is something that I don't think many of us really thought about when we read Jonah, the book of Jonah. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Uh, it says that, again, when God troubles the sea on which he was traveling and the threat of men's lives now being in danger because of him, his compassion for these very Gentiles, these men on the ship who were not Jews, and the realization that the ship is not going to make it back to shore. In other words, when you're reading these, these first two chapters, you're finding that these men are in trouble. And they're in trouble in the sea, not because of something they've done. They're in trouble because of something Jonah has done or not done. And now we're at a point where they're at a point of no return. Okay, they can't get back to sea. I mean, get back to shore. And so, and, 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 the, and the seas are just tearing the ship up. And so they don't have a choice here. Something's going on. And so we find that it says that Jonah understands. And jo Jonah understands what's happening because he told the man earlier in the scripture why he was running away. But his compassion for these Gentile sailors and the realization that the ship was not going to make it back to shore, he believes that giving his life is the only chance of their survival. 
I want you to think about this, brothers and sisters. Jonah's in a position where he now has to think about two things, himself or the men on that ship. And what does he do? He decides to think about the men on that ship. In other words, he believed that given his life is the only chance of their survival. He believes that given his life is the only chance of their survival. And so what does he do? He comes to realize that he has boxed himself in. And being boxed in, he comes to understand why God had commanded him to go to Nineveh in the first place. See, it didn't dawn on him at first because he was only thinking about himself. He was only thinking about his nation and how God is the God of Israel and not the God of these other Gentile nations. And his hatred for, for the Assyrians and Gentiles in general was great. But in all that's happening here, in this event, Jonah, without probably unknowingly, is coming to a point where he now understands, or he will understand, why God has said, why God has told him to do what he has done. Because even before he has done this, he has, in other words, even before he has gone to Nineveh, the thing that God is trying to tell him to do, he's already doing it in a small manner, right here on this ship. And that's why it says this. He comes to the understand, he comes to understand why God had commanded him to go to Nineveh. Now, now only at this point he understands and decides to do what? He decides to give his life, thinking that his end has come. And so the men on the ship, having cast lots and finding out that Jonah, Jonah was the one who had brought the trouble on this of the seas upon them. They said to him, what? They said, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, he said, they said. And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So they're asking Jonah all these questions amidst the storms of the, of the sea and the fact that they're about to perish. And Jonah, Jonah's reply, was almost spoken with a sense of pride, telling them this. He says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the dry land, he says. And so before asking to be thrown into the sea, Jonah witnesses firsthand that the men on the ship Gentiles, if you will, heard Jonah's words concerning his God. And brothers and sisters, these men who had called upon their own gods or idols now recognized that it was not their God who had caused the rough seas, but it was Jonah's God. And so what does that mean? That means that Jonah's God is the God of gods. Jonah's God is the God who, who controls nature. Jonah's God is the God of all creation. These men, these Gentiles now realize that uh, their idols, their gods, can't compete with Jonah's God. And so, and so you know, they, they recognize that it was not their God who had caused the rough seas, but Jonah's God. Now, listen to these words after Jonah had told them, what, uh, after uh, Jonah had told them earlier that he was doing what? He was running from the presence of the Lord. Therefore, they cried out, who? Running from who? The Lord God, the God of the Hebrews, he says. And they said this, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleases you. Now, think about this. These men are now praying to the God of Jonah. They are not praying to their gods anymore. They're not praying to their idols. They are now praying to the God who has control over nature, who has control 
over the seas. They get it. They get it, you see. And so two events have happened here, brothers and sisters. Jonah, a man who believed that his nation, the nation of Israel, was the only nation God cared about, he finds himself doing the very thing he didn't want to do in Nineveh. He didn't want to do it. In other words, he preached God to other men and they believed. And whatever small event it was, when Jonah made the comments that he made that he was a Hebrew, that he was the God of all creation, the God of, you know, who created the seas and the dry land, that was a witness. That was a testimony. <clears throat> and so, secondly, he does something that was a type, a type of Christ Jesus. Because of his compassion for those on board and his willingness to die for the men on the ship so that they might live, Jonah now considers himself an individual who must make a decision. And Jonah voluntarily, by his own volition, asks the men to do what? To throw him overboard. In other words, Jonah says, I will die for you in order that you might live. And so Jonah sacrificed himself so that others might live. Now, does this sound familiar, brothers and sisters? Without a doubt, Jonah knew he was going to die, without a doubt, okay? All hope was lost. In other words, Jonah knew this. Jonah says, in his mind, he's saying this. I'm going to give myself, I'm going to give my life for these men. I know I'm going to die because when I get thrown in this raging sea, that's it. That's it. So he says that uh, all hope was lost for him. And now if we, we, if we were catching this uh, or watching this rather play out on this History Channel, for example, I always like using that History Channel. If we were actually watching this on TV, for example, we would understand this book a little bit better because we would see the graphics. We would see what we're reading here. And so I said earlier, brothers and sisters, that the key to understanding any biblical book is to find the setting in which it was written, written first. Right. Now, although the men could have probably seized the land, there was no way that they were going to be able to get back to it. They were incapable of returning. And Jonah knew this, and Jonah does, he makes a conscious decision. A man who was, a, who was an Israelite, he makes a conscious decision to die for those that he didn't even know. Nor were the Israelites. And so when he makes that decision and the men were left with no other way to save the ship, he was cast into the depths of the sea. And I want you to picture this. And so the door of death was opened. Waiting for him was the grave. As he sank down into the raging waters. But this was not Jonah's time to die, brothers and sisters. Instead, our gracious God had another place for him to reside and spend the next three days and nights in. It would be in the belly of a large fish that was sent by God to swallow him up. Like our Savior, Jesus to Christ, this was Jonah's temporary tomb, you see. And as he finds himself in the belly of this large fish, he experienced the reality of what it was like to slowly die. Not from the sea, but being encased inside the belly of a mammal. Alive. And as he prayed what he thought was his last prayers, Jonah is now looking up 
while inside the bellies, the fish's belly, he thinks of God's temple and Jerusalem. And so we see in this story, brothers and sisters, the character of God as being sovereign and the providence of God. Now, think about this. Why was Jonah swallowed by this great fish? Why? And for what purpose? When Jonah was thrown overboard, he expected to die in the sea and hoped that the men on the ship would now be saved. In other words, Jonah gave his life so that others might live. He gave a brief but powerful testimony. He, in, in other words, brothers and sisters, in this testimony, a very brief but effective sermon was believed on by the men of that ship. Now, you can imagine, if you read the scripture, if you read Jonah, you will find, which is not in the story yet today, you will find that when they threw Jonah over into the water, what happened? The waters calmed right on down. The seas calmed right down. Now, you can imagine what's going through the minds of these men. Jonah's not witnessing this because Jonah's now sinking down into the sea. But these men experienced the calmness of the sea. And what do they do? They give praise to the God of heaven and earth. They no longer give praise to their idols. They know who's, who's in control now. And so their God would now be Jonah's God. The sting of death was snatched away from Jonah. And after spending three days and three nights entombed in the belly of a fish, God commanded the fish to spew Jonah up out of the tomb he had been encased and onto dry land. Surely that's no problem for God. If God can calm the storming seas, the raging seas, he, and if God can command a fish to swallow up Jonah's, Jonah, surely God can command that same fish to spew him out. That's not a problem with God. And so I want to turn your attention now to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 38 through 41. Just for a moment. First of all, the story of Jonah must apparently be a true story. For the Lord does not say that it was a parable. But most importantly, brothers and sisters, Jesus applies the story of Jonah to his own life and character. If the scribes and Pharisees wanted to see a sign from Jesus, he says to them to look no further than the story of Jonah among the scrolls of the Old Testament. As Jonah had given testimony saying, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the dry land. Even so, Jesus came to give a testimony also, you see. His testimony would be greater than Jonah. And his testimony would not be just to the Jewish nation, you see. When the scribes and Pharisees said this, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Jesus knew their hypocrisy and their hatred of him. And so what sign were they looking for? Well, it was, you know, it was it was it a, a sign of his authority or his deity? Uh, Jesus goes on to say this. An evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And here is where we can now apply the story of Jonah to the life of Christ. Because Jesus gives us 
and gives the scribes and the Pharisees a direct comparison. Jesus says that you want to see a sign? Read Jonah. That's what he's saying. Read Jonah. But then he goes on and he begins to explain. He says this. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, this is Jesus speaking, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This was to be the sign of the Savior's authority, power, and deity, you see. If, if, if the Pharisees and the scribes was looking for a sign, the sign of Jesus' authority, all they needed to do was look, look to Jonah because this is about to happen to the Savior. If this was to be the sign of the Savior's authority, his power, and his deity. And if you read the scripture, you know that the scripture says that death couldn't keep him in the grave, couldn't keep him in the ground. Before giving his life, Jonah gave a message. And three days later, what happened? He was spewed up on the land or a type of resurrection, if you will, to do what? To continue to give God's message to the Gentile nation of Nineveh. For what purpose? We're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. Our Lord gave his life for the world. We find it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Just like Jonah. He did it willingly and of his own volition, brothers and sisters. Our Lord then, when he gave his life, the scripture tells us all in all four of the gospels that he was resurrected from the grave after three days and three nights to do what? not only to be a living witness of his authority, power, and deity, but to continue to give his message through his disciples. And what was that message? It would be the same message that Jonah is to, be, is to give to, the, to Nineveh in terms of repentance, if you will, because Jesus, he, what? Jesus says, he said, repent and be saved. Repent and be saved. And so it would be a message that has now spread and is still spreading throughout the world. This was the sign Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees to watch for. That would be the sign. And we know we know that it happened. We know according to the scripture that three days after three days and three nights Jesus rose from the he rose from the grave. He was not only he not only rolled, but he was seen for another 40 days while he lived on the earth. He was seen by others. And I'm sure that he was probably seen by the very scribes and Pharisees that he had told to read the scroll of Jonah. I'm sure he was seen. They were he was seen by them. And so this was the sign that Jesus told the Pharisees and the scribes to watch for. Now, they may not have known Jesus, but they could have believed him. And so as we, as we read verses uh, 3 and 4, it says, so Jonah does what? After all is said and done, Jonah does what? Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Jonah learned his lesson. Jonah now understand what he has to do. He's still angry, but he understand what he has to do. And Jonah, the scripture goes on to say, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's very interesting. That's very interesting because Jonah, after three days and three nights, is spewed out on land or resurrected, resurrected, if you will. Well, guess what? Well, Jesus, after three days and three nights, was resurrected, and he was seen for another what? 
40 days. The same thing, the same words that uh, that uh, that uh, Jonah is telling the people of Nineveh. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So Jonah is now giving the people what God has said to him. And now the people have 40 days to do what? Repent. And so in verses 5 through 8, he goes on to say, so the people of Nineveh, they did what? They believed God. They believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Now that, brothers and sisters, is some deep remorse. He, and he said, and the scripture goes on to say, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying that neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Those people believed, brothers and sisters, that king believed the words of Jonah. Jesus continues to give a parallel view of the story of Jonah by telling them that the men of Nineveh, he was, telling, he was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, the men of Nineveh, the very people that we're talking about now, will rise up in the judgment, in other words, the day of judgment, with this generation that he's talking about, and they will do what? Condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And then Jesus goes on to say what? And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. He makes another comparison. He says, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment or the day of judgment with this generation and condemn it. For what reason? He says, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. So what Jesus is saying is that neither will these scribes and Pharisees Neither will they they believe God, believe the words of Jesus, neither will they repent, but they won't even hear the wisdom of our Savior. They won't hear uh, or comprehend or believe the words of Jesus. These are two examples of Gentile nations who heard the words of judgment and words of wisdom and believed, even though they were not Israelites. Jesus says to his, uh, says that his, uh, says to his own people that someone has come who is greater than Jonah and the queen of the south. Though being Gentiles, they both heard and they believed. But though Jesus was heard, he was rejected by his own people. But the Savior will, believe, will be believed upon by other nations, other Gentiles. In fact, the king of Nineveh and the people received the words of Jonah, repented, and believed, saying, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. And so verse 9 says, who, he goes on to say, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we might not perish? And so they're not sure, they're not sure the people of Nineveh hoped that God would postpone judgment, that he would relent if the people obeyed Jonah and turned to God. 
Now, God's words, God's word, brothers and sisters, is for everyone. In other words, despite the wickedness of the Ninevite people, they were open to receive God's word and believe. Now, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul writes this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so within us, all brothers and sisters, there's something that we have to recognize. If you think about what Jonah did, his, he, 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 his natural inclination says that he was going to not do what God says to do. Now, there's a term for that. Within each of us, brothers and sisters, there is what's called an evil inclination. An evil inclination. Inclination, we're inclined to do something, okay? It is a congenital inclination that's present at birth to do what? To rebel. Now, we're all, we're all uh, witnesses of this. One of the, you know, I used to say one of the first things that a kid, that comes out of a kid's, a, a toddler's mouth is no. I might be exaggerating, but you get my point. And so it is a congenital inclination present at birth to rebel or to do to do what, 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 what God says not to do or to do what God says, uh, what the parent says not to do, for example. So it's a, it's a natural inclination. It's something that's done. And so what we find is that um, it is a, it is a, um, it is the term evil inclination is drawn from the phrase, the imagination of the heart of men is evil. The imagination of the heart of men is evil, which occurs twice in the Hebrew Bible. Once in Genesis chapter six, verse five, which says, then the Lord saw the wickedness of men was great uh, in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And then again, we find in Genesis chapter eight, verse 21, which reads, and the Lord smelled a smooth, a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of his heart, of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. And finally, we find in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, that the Lord says, the heart, the heart. Now, what he's mean, what he means by this, now obviously, he's not talking about this beating organ that's in our chest. He, he's talking about the soul, our soul, which is the seat of emotions and passions consisting of will, intellect, and emotion. He is saying the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And again, the heart is the soul, the seat of emotions and passions consisting of the will, the intellect, and emotion. In other words, in other words, brothers and sisters, our soul can be influenced by our inclination to do good or more naturally to do evil because we have inherited it from Adam, a nature that is by default rebellious. That is why it's so important to be saved. Time does not allow me to go uh, more into depth on this matter. But know this, Jesus Christ is the cure. The people of Nineveh were indeed wicked. That is, all, that is absolutely true. And their army, their army was past cruel. But the word of God in Jonah's day, as well as today, is the word of God that is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is what? The discerner of the thoughts 
and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And so all rights that we put off concerning form our formal conduct, the old man who grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and he does and, and says for us to do what? To be renewed in the spirit of our mind that we put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. And finally, brothers and sisters, we find in verse 10 where it reads, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he has said he would bring upon him, upon them, and he did not do it. And so the message of Jonah is that God's judgment, even when declared in prophecy, can be averted by genuine repentance. Now I want you to take this on from a from a not only a spiritual perspective, from a but a personal perspective. Okay, from a personal perspective, God's judgment can be averted when we turn from doing sin and turn to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, if God forgave the heathen sailors in their cry for forgiveness, if God forgave Jonah, and gave him another chance. And if God forgave the people of Nineveh, a cruel people, if you will, a cruel Gentile nation, how much more will he forgive his own people of whom Jonah may be regarded as representing? The people of Jonah's day needed to know that Yahweh, our God, was the Lord of Assyria as well as the Lord of Israel. And that behind all his judgments was his love. The Old Testament prophets are gone, but their prophecies are still being fulfilled. Revelation is the last book of prophecy. And so we should all understand, brothers and sisters, that God has always given mankind, indeed all kind, to include races from other worlds, the space to turn from wrong and turn to right. Regardless of our evil inclinations, desire to rebel against the Creator. So God has put us, put in us the power to clean, brothers and sisters. And so with that, let us choose life. Our words to remember for today comes from Matthew chapter 28, verse 31. But what do you think? A man has had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it. And he went. Then he came. Um, he says that. Uh, it goes on to say, then he came. He says, he says to them, which of the two? Because there was one who said that he would, but he did not. And so he goes on to say, which of the two did the will of his father? And the people who were, he was talking to said, uh, the first one. And so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Now, what he's saying is that there are those, the, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, and the, low, the lowly in life, they believed God. They believed the words of Jesus. But the scribes and the Pharisees, those who rejected him, uh, did not believe it. Even though they said it, they did not believe it. Then in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, 
unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so with that, that ends our uh, adult Bible study for today. Uh, next week, brothers and sisters, Lord willing, we'll be studying uh, the book of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And so I will be sending out um, uh, the outline in Matthew later on in the week. And so with that, our time has ended. Let us have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask and pray, Heavenly Father, that now the Holy Spirit might, Lord, just take your words and help us to understand its true meaning. Help us to compare, oh Lord, your word. Help us to compare scripture with scripture. Pre precept upon precept, line upon line, a little here, a little there. Help us, Lord, to Lord, to internalize your word, that we might receive from you, O Lord, the Holy Spirit's teaching. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. We thank you for the time that you have given us, Lord, to come together and to praise and to worship you in spirit and in truth. To come together and to fellowship not only with one another, but with you also, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is in the name of Jesus, Father, that we give you the praise and the glory that only you deserve, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for another day. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Have a blessed week. This conference will now be recorded. Oops.